Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me here. Um, so today, you're stuck with me for the whole afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, decision forests first in general, what they are and what they can do for you, then some applications into medical image analysis, and then in the second lecture uh, or talk, I will be uh, you know, digging down a you know, little deeper into segmentation. By segmentation, I mean semantic segmentation, i.e. recognition and segmentation. So that's, you know, the, the quick outline of, you know, this afternoon. Uh, I hope I'll manage to keep you awake, but if you feel like, you know, having a nap, feel free, no worries. But I hope you wake up by the end for interesting questions. So we'll start with a quick introduction to machine learning. So a lot of you have heard of machine learning. Many of you are experts in machine learning. But for the ones of you who are not, uh, then I'll give a very brief introduction to what machine learning is. Uh, then I will specialize this to decision forests and you know, talk about the benefits of decision forests as one of the many possible machine learning algorithms and models. And just like that, in the same way, in the second talk, you know, I will mention briefly uh, something about uh, deep learning. You know, we have all you know, heard you know, these buzzwords going around. I'll try to come up with a definition of deep learning and try to talk about many different ways in which you can do deep learning and then you know, go into the guts of semantic segmentation. So hopefully this will be informative and enjoyable. Um, and again, you know, please feel free to ask questions you know, let's say, you know, towards the end, but if there are pressing questions during, uh, during the talk as well, you know, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, so machine learning. Right. So machine learning is all about, you know, data. We have data which is somewhat uh, labeled. And so I'm representing this. Do we have a pointer anyway? Or if not, it's no problem. I can use the mouse. Sorry, should have this is a remote control. Sorry about this. Oh, here. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I found it. Thank you very much. So we've got what's called uh, labeled data. So I'm representing my data points, my units of data, you know, with these little squares, gray squares, and the attached labels, you know, with these circles. There are different colors. In this case, they represent different labels. Um, so you know, the squares represent some measurements, something that we can observe. Say, for instance, if there are images, they can be the RGB you know, uh, colors for all the pixels, this sort of stuff. Um, and the labels can be, for instance, tumor, no tumor. It could be you know, sheep, cow, building, tree, if those are the classes that we're interested in classifying. So sometimes we use the term features for the measurements or its derived forms and you know, labels or um, what else with classes for you know, the output in the case of classification. So here I'm talking about one very specific type of machine learning algorithms, which is classification, where the input is in whatever form it comes. But the output that we want to achieve is in a discrete form, so a discrete set of classes. So it's enumerable, you can count them, and you know, you know what, what you want, you know what those are. There are other types of machine learning algorithms where, for instance, the output is continuous. And so it could be temperature or house prices, and then we're talking about regression. It could be multivariate as well. Right, so if we have all this data, and someone has gone through the effort of labeling this data for us, um, then what we do, typically in very you know, um, high-level description, you know, we feed this data into a training algorithm which you know, crunches you know, numbers for hours or days or sometimes weeks, and then it spits out a learned model. In this case, again, because we are talking about classification, it will be a classifier. I'm representing this learned model with a set of uh, nodes and edges connecting them, but it's a very uh, cloudy, as you can see, generic picture, which tends to represent this as being a tree, for instance, a decision tree, or a neural network, or many other things, okay? So it's a very generic you know, picture, it's just an icon. So in the second phase, which is normally called the testing phase, or runtime, whatever you want to call it, 
then we have an input previously unseen you know, data point for which we don't have the label, we only have the measurements, we only have the square. And what we want to do is we feed this into you know, my classifier, which has been learned and stored to disk, and that will spit out a, a class label. Well, this is a very simplistic view, of course. You know, things are more complicated than that. And for instance, you know, what I want to get is not just a point-wise estimate of the class, uh, but a probabilistic estimate. And so perhaps you know, in the case of classification, what I want to get out here is a multinomial distribution in the form of a histogram, for instance, you know, which class is more likely, but also take into account all the other classes as well. So this is a, a very general overview. And here is a very simple uh, toy example. Again, I'm sure many of you don't need this, but I'm, I want to start you know, slowly and then you know, pick up pace later on. Imagine that we have a set of images this could be patients or non-patients, or it could be, like in this case, they are you know, sharks and lizards. I should have replaced the sharks with tuna fish, but I didn't have these pictures ready. So imagine that we want to you know, distinguish those two sets of you know, images. So what we can do is we start by designing a set of features. And they can be extremely simple, like, you know, for instance, the average you know, amount of red in the image and the average amount of you know, blue in the image. So this is a very simplistic two-dimensional feature space. And if we take each of these pictures and represent them into this very much reduced feature space, you know, we get this distribution of data points. Um, it's difficult to read it here, but it says sharks here and lizards here. So nicely clustered, as we would expect. This is an extremely simple example. And of course, you, uh, you know, my data point representation can be in many more dimensions. Just one more dimension up from two will be three dimensions, and you know, these are the clusters that we get. And then, OK, once I have, <coughs> once I have you know, this cloud of data, you know, they can be very highly dimensional. Uh, the dimension of each data point can actually be infinite, truly infinite as well, and we can still deal with that, amazingly enough. And we can have a very large number of you know, input training data. Um, once I have this, what I want to do is I want to come up with a general function, a general mapping, which given any you know, point in this feature space, it maps it either to, say, the left side or to the right side. And this is a, what we call a classifier. A classifier, in this case, takes the form of this you know, separating surface. Again, imagine this being in a very high dimensional space. And the process of you know, doing this generalization from some discrete set of you know, training data to a generic you know, function that you know, does this mapping from the feature space to the class space is called induction. And again, it's one of the many forms of machine learning. There is transduction, there is semi-supervised learning, there is um, unsupervised learning, there is a lot of other stuff. So to make things a little bit more practical, um, this is pretty much what was used when you know, Microsoft Research uh, produced Kinect. So you know, many of you uh, play games, I don't. Uh, many of you might have Xbox at home, I do because of my kids. <laughs> um, so if you also have a Kinect sensor, then you know that there is some computer vision technology happening you know, behind the scenes. And this is what's going on. So on the left side, you know, we have some image measurements, you know, which is a depth image. That's what the sensor gives us. You know, one of the cameras in the Kinect sensor is a depth camera. So for each pixel, it measures how far away it is in millimeters from the camera plane itself. And so we can you know, visualize it as a, a grayscale sort of you know, image. <coughs> and what we do on the Xbox platform, you know, we run our software. You know, which is partly implemented on the CPU, partly implemented on the GPU to be you know, efficient. And it spits out this intermediate representation, which is color coded. What we've done is we've trained our pixel wise classifier. So each pixel here has been classified as belonging to one out of 31 different body parts. Uh, it means that the system has been trained with all, you know, with masses of training data, which has been split up into 31 body parts. And then you know, um, we have trained a classifier which has tuned these parameters to be able to produce the image we have on the right. And of course, the, the image on the right is you know, very noisy. It's not perfect, but it is still strong enough. There is a strong enough 
signal to be able to drive the next stages, which is you know, skeleton fitting and then eventually you know, using that skeleton for uh, driving the game, the gameplay. Interesting that all the references are unreadable, but perhaps that's a good thing. So let's dig a little bit more into the structure of the algorithm, the classifier itself. We uh, decided to use decision trees. Uh, they are very old news. We didn't invent decision trees, but you know, we did you know, tweak with them and we invented new variants of decision trees, um, which work you know, for millions or billions of you know, pixels in a very, very efficient way. So perhaps one of the main reasons why you know, we settled for decision forest rather than other uh, classifiers out there is because of their efficiency and extremely high level of parallelism. So let me walk you through a little bit you know, what decision uh, trees are and what they can do for you. So a tree is a specific type of graph which doesn't have cycles. And in particular, it is rooted, so there is one spatial uh, node, which is at the you know, top here, it's called the root node. And in this case, we're looking at a binary decision tree, so each node has got you know, two, exactly two children. So the internal nodes are also called split nodes, we will see why that is. And then there are terminal nodes, or leaf nodes, right at the end, which don't have any children, they just you know, stop there. Now, Imagine that I gave you a problem to solve, which is, you know, if you take a picture of you know, the harbor you know, behind here, um, and I want to devise a, an algorithm you know, which can tell me straight away, instantaneously, whether that picture was taken indoors or outdoors. So if you knew nothing about machine learning, what you would do is you would you know, sat down, sit down on a computer and you know, start typing you know, lines after lines of C code or MATLAB code or whatever your favorite language is. And what you do is you start doing these sort of things. You start asking questions. Uh, for instance, is the top part of the image blue? If it is blue, then you know, your brain tells you that you know, then perhaps you know, the likelihood of that picture being taken outdoors is higher because that blueness might be related to the fact that you're, you know, it's a photograph of a piece of sky. Uh, but equally, then you say, oh, wait a minute. You know, I, perhaps I need to you know, also look at the bottom part of the picture because if that is also blue, maybe I'm just you know, looking at a picture of a blue wall or a blue piece of you know, furniture, so it is indoors. Um, so this is something that you would do by hand. So it's a, it's a cascaded, nested set of you know, if then, if then statements. And you know, that's what you know, we've done many times in past algorithms, but unfortunately, uh, computer vision or medical imaging uh, analysis is not, is never that easy and there are always lots and lots of exceptions and so you need to be able to, you know, ahead of time, you know, prevent these exceptions and, you know, strange cases. And so the only way I know of to make this sort of nested if-then statements algorithms work is if you learn the structure of the algorithm and the nature of those, you know, if questions all automatically. That is, by definition, a decision tree. There is nothing else to it. So it's as simple as that. So a decision tree is nothing else but you know, a, a piece of data architecture, or if you want also code architecture, algorithm architecture, um, which is capable of being trained. And so all these if statements, you can you know, optimize their nature, the type of questions that are asked, and where these questions are asked. Are they asked at the root node or are they asked at lower down uh, split nodes and, and so on. So during training, if I have you know, figured out the, the structure of this tree and the questions and, and all of that, then if I have a lot of training images for which I do know if they are indoors or outdoors or I know if they are sharks or lizards and so on, I can just you know, push them through the tree and each of these images will end up in a different leaf node and then I can very simply accumulate the statistics and just count how many images arrive, how many training images arrive of each class at each of the leaf nodes. And I can store those histograms, and there you go, you know, you're done with the training bit. And then the testing is just as simple. You take a picture, you send it down the tree, answering the right you know, questions as they you know, come through and you know, diverting that data point left or right depending on the answer until you reach a leaf and then you read out the statistics. Extremely simple. So let's try um, 
a slightly more complex toy example, which rather than having two classes, is got you know, four classes. So this is another advantage of decision forest over many other techniques, such as boosting or support vector machines. Boosting and support vector machines, although they have also been adapted to work with multiple classes, they were born uh, specifically for you know, dealing with a binary class partitioning problem. Uh, while in a decision tree, you know, dealing with multiple classes is inherent. It's just in the nature of what a tree does. There is no difference whatsoever between dealing with two or with more than two classes. So in this case, we have again a, a bi-dimensional uh, feature space, and we have four classes with four different colors. And so if we want to train a decision tree which has got this sort of you know, shape, you know, what we can do is we can say, OK, I'm going to... Um, uh, optimize you know, my split function at each of the split nodes, uh, but I, I do need to you know, settle something. I do need to decide on something. In this case, I decide that the nature of the split function is a linear function, linear in the, uh, in the uh, two-dimensional space of features. So it could be this line, or it could be this line, or it could be this line, for instance, if I'm training the root, or it could be this line. And intuitively, you know, our brain tells us that this line is probably better than all the other lines I've tried because it does a better job at separating you know, these two classes on the left and these other two classes on the right without much mixing of you know, the two. Um, and this is, this is, sorry, a good intuition which can be quantified and measured you know, with you know, pretty standard techniques such as entropy. So I can measure something called information gain, which is derived from the Shannon entropy measure, and indeed come up with you know, this answer as being the optimal separation at this stage. So very simple. I randomly try many, many, many you know, of these you know, possible candidate you know, splitting functions, until I, and then I choose and I freeze the one that best optimizes, maximizes the information gain. And now that I've done this, again, I freeze these parameters into my root node, and then I can proceed you know, to the left. So all the data to the left of this line gets sent to the left child, let's say, and now I can optimize the left child. And I go on and on until I find a, a nice you know, separating you know, line. Notice that this segment stops here because there is conditioning going on, because you know, we know that these points now belong to a subset of the original uh, set. And we can you know, proceed on the other side as well. We stop here, and things might not be perfect, especially if you know, the, the ground truth training you know, data points that we have, if they mix with one another, they are not actually se linearly separable, then it might be impossible to separate them perfectly, and that's still okay. We'll see why that is okay. So this is the formulation of information gain. You know, nothing, not much to be said about it. It's just a bunch of entropy computations over uh, histograms, very easy to do, very quick to do. Um, but you know, what's interesting and what hasn't been done much in the past is to analyze this very simple model in a little bit more depth. So what happens, for instance, if I change the nature of my split function? Um, interestingly, perhaps 90 or more percent of you know, papers which use decision forests, they use what we call axis aligned you know, split functions, where what you do is you just choose you know, one of the many possible coordinates of this feature space. Say, for instance, just you know, the red channel or just the green channel or just the you know, CT scan or just the MR scan, you know, T1, T2, whichever it is. And just based on that, then you uh, randomly or in an optimized way select a threshold, then you just say whatever goes to the right goes to the right child, whatever is to the left goes to the left child. But what if we change that? No one you know, tells us that we cannot use more complex models. And this is what we have you know, studied a little bit. So earlier I showed an example where this line could, be, could, be, could have general orientation, or it could be a surface, it could be a smooth, you know, spline surface in a high dimensional space, for instance, or in this 2D case, it could be a conic section or anything else that you can think of. So what happens is that the behavior of the forest changes dramatically. In particular, what changes is the generalization. So as you probably know, generalization, which is the opposite of overfitting, is a very, very important, you know, topic in all machine learning algorithms. So you want to avoid a situation where your neural network or your SVM you know, understands the training data inside out perfectly well, 
so well that you know, it doesn't know anything about new, previously unseen data, the test data. So you want to be able to do both things, to train well on the training data, but also achieve high accuracy on the test data as well. And not much theory has been developed you know, there, you know, apart, apart from, perhaps from you know, the, the Bayesian theory. Uh, in the discriminative setting, there isn't all that much. But you know, we try to push you know, the, the boundaries a little bit. So like we said, you know, during, so this is, this is a, a real decision tree, which is almost invisible. But imagine here being a lot of you know, faint edges connecting all these nodes. Um, this is a real tree trained on a real image classification uh, problem. It turns out that you, know, you don't need very deep trees. For instance, uh, in the Kinect problem, in order to achieve you know, good accuracy, you know, we were able to achieve it with uh, something, uh, with a set of, I believe, three trees only, which were at maximum 20 levels deep, which is roughly this sort of, you know, tree. Um, so it, you don't need, you know, hundreds and hundreds, but then, you know, uh, or levels, but then it all depends on the application and how complex the data is. So what we're observing, for instance, recently, is that if you try to use the same algorithm as the Kinect one, but on RGB color images, then things are much more complicated. In order to get similar levels of accuracy, you need to go down much deeper. And there are a lot of issues with that, you know, let alone issues with memory management. Like, you know, this stuff grows with the power of two law. And so, you know, very quickly you end up having billions of nodes and it's very difficult to store them in memory. It's very difficult to, you know, access memory very fast with, even with modern architectures. But we will see in a minute how we try to fix that problem. Right, so the other uh, innovation which is really important and makes a huge difference is that, you know, rather than using a single decision tree which has been, you know, optimized to death, if you use an ensemble, a collection of multiple decision trees, things tend to work a lot better, especially in terms of generalization. So you might not see much change in terms of training error, but when you look at the test error, things are very different. But there again, you know, a lot of papers have said this before us, you know, in particular Leo Brayman's uh, seminal work at, you know, in machine learning conferences. But then the question is, you know, how do I make these trees meaningful at the same time different from one another? So there are many ways in which you can inject randomness during the tree training process. And we have you know, looked at you know, a couple of them you know, in details. And again, we have tried to figure out you know, some of the uh, basic principles that make you know, forests work and how those changes affect the generalization error. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, unfortunately, it really is invisible. Okay, well, that's all right. I'll uh, draw stuff for you. Um, so once we have many different trees, here we have four, one, two, three, and four. What happens during test time is that you, know, you push each data point into each tree, and each of them will reach a different leaf you know, in each of these trees. So at, at each of these leaves, you can read a different, say, histogram, a different tree store distribution. Now I've got four answers to my problem. What do I do with them? The simplest thing ever, which is averaging them all together. And you can average those distributions in at least two different ways. One is, you know, some average. The other one is, you know, product geometric average. Um, and they will give you very widely different responses. One of them will be very highly peaked on the most confident tree. All these trees will have different confidence in their output. The average instead, you know, the, the algebraic average will tend to preserve also less, you know, confident, you know, trees as well, which is quite important, which is, you know, very nice. Oh, this is getting romantic. <laughs> so all of this analysis has been done in a book which you all have to go and buy because the proceeds go to charity, that's why. But also because it's got some interesting content. You know, all these analysis that we've been doing about what happens if I change these bit bits and pieces you know, of the forest model, how does that affect you know, the ultimate you know, classification accuracy, not only at train time, but more importantly, during test time, which is when it really counts. What happens to, you know, not only to the accuracy, but also to the efficiency. For instance, you know, here is an example. Here, uh, it's difficult to see, but I've got uh, four spiral arms. 
they are color coded from yellow, green, red, and blue. They represent the uh, you know, distribution of four different classes. Imagine they can be companies or animals or images or whatever you like. And what we want to do is we want to be able to train a classifier which works well on all the points of this you know, square. So even here or in between in here. So if we use a forest with uh, many trees, I think you know, we have you know, dozens of trees in here, but maximum depth of five, and we use axis aligned split functions, this is what you get. You get a lot of you know, artifacts. Um, and this has not you know, been shown before, but intuitively it makes a lot of sense. If instead I use you know, oriented lines type of you know, split functions at the different nodes, I get something which is a little bit better, at least visually a little bit better, because you can see that in between the arms it tends to generalize the behavior that you really want a little bit better. And then if I use a, a conic section in this case, I get very nice and smooth uh, results. Of course, which model to use you know, it all depends on the application, it all depends on the intrinsic structure of the data. So it's always difficult to choose the right model, but it's important to know what the effect of choosing the, a different model or the wrong model is on the final results. And equally, what happens if we increase the depth of the tree for each of these three different split models? If we go from depth 5 to depth three, 13, for instance, we see that the colors become a lot more saturated. You know, there is less gray in my visual representation here, which is an indication that the uncertainty decreases. So the final output is more confident. But that doesn't mean necessarily good news, because in this case, in this case the, the final output is more confident than before, and yet very wrong. So there is still no generalization, no good generalization capabilities. So you have to be very, very careful with these concepts of generalization, of confidence, and you know, the, the number of model parameters that you enable in the system and how to control them. So these are all very important topics in machine learning. Right, so the good news is that, you know, even if you decide not to buy the book, you know, you can still download the free software that accompanies it. And so this is great. It's software which is uh, written in C++ and C Sharp. You know, of course, you can call the executables from MATLAB, and what you do is you can you know, look at the source code and you can dig into it and what you will find is that the terminology and nomenclature that we use in the code is almost exactly the same as what we use in the book. And so you can you know, follow things you know, side by side and just by running some very simple command lines which we give you, uh, you can reproduce exactly the figures that we have in the book and then you can play with it and you can say what happens if rather than having three classes I've got five classes or six classes what happens if rather than having a two-dimensional feature vector you know I've got a, a ten-dimensional one and then step by step you can start to modify this code and make it fit to your application and I know for sure that a lot of people in the Mikai community have already used our library, have transformed it, and have, you know, they have written successful papers at Mikai. So I hope you can um, find good use for this code as well. But earlier on I was talking about some issues with forests and trees. In particular, the problem that um, they grow exponentially you know, with the number of levels. And for real problems, you know, you might need to have, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, or maybe more levels for these sort of things to be useful. Um, so it's very difficult to, to make these things fit into memory, you know, especially if in each of these nodes you want to store some useful information like, you know, class statistics or, you know, the type of feature that was selected and the split function, if you have a certain number of parameters, everything becomes a little bit too complex. Uh, but the other problem, which is also very important and nobody talks about, is the fact that you know, when you train a tree, imagine that I've got you know, one million training data points. In average, because this is a binary tree, I will get you know, half a million to the left child and half a million to the right child, and then a quarter million you know, to the first node and, and so on. So the data is split into the number of children you have every time you move one level down. And especially in the medical setting where getting you know, hold of you know, uh, data is extremely difficult, extremely expensive, and you have to you know, build you know, networking and interaction with hospitals and clinicians. You know, it takes a lot of effort and it's very expensive. 
uh, there are privacy issues as well. You want to make the best possible view, use of the little training data that you have, especially if you, you have gone through the effort of labeling pixel by pixel. So the fact that you, know, um, you end up training these nodes here you know, with 10 examples or five examples is not very good, also because from a statistical point of view, you don't have enough evidence to really build um, meaningful statistics. So what can we do? Well, we can go from trees to directed acyclic graphs. So these are called DAGs in, in brief. And these are you know, a different type of data structure that you know, many of us have studied in operational research type of uh, courses where we still have a directed type of you know, graph, but there are still no cycles in the sense that you know, these two arrows you know, go in the same way. So you can interpret this very simply as a tree, but where some of the nodes have been merged to together. So imagine that this red node for originally was made up from two different nodes, but you merge them together. And why does this make sense? Why would you do this? Well, let's try to think a little bit about this. Of course, you know, here is the jungle. The jungle is just like a forest, but rather than being composed of trees, it's composed of dugs. I couldn't come up with a sillier name, but you know, that's where we are. Um, so jungles help a lot you know, in dealing with memory consumption. Imagine that I have a tree and a dug, and they achieve the same accuracy, but the dug is inherently a lot smaller because you have done a lot of this node merging. So you can save a lot of um, Power, a lot of memory storage, but also, you know, this was the uh, nice intuition, it might also help with generalization. So the fact that you reduce the model complexity in this way, going from a tree, from a binary tree, to a DAG, you reduce the model complexity because you merge a lot of these nodes together. And this, rather than hurting your accuracy, if it's done correctly, it might also help you. And we will see why, we'll see how. So imagine that you know, we have this other very simple problem. We have, um, we need, I, I love animals, so I always have this sort of animal-based examples. In this case, we want to separate cows from sheep. We got images of cows and images of sheep, and you know, we extract patches from them. And so we, um, and we also have a third class, which is grass. So grass could be yellowish, brownish, or green, dark, and sheep can be, you know, have a white wool and cows can be brown, just, just as an example. Again, I can represent these patches into a, a simple uh, two-dimensional feature space. And if I look at, you know, if I have many such training examples, maybe I have all the sheep, you know, clustering around here, all the cows, you know, here, the little squares that you see. And then the grass can be sort of bimodal, could be, you know, dark green, or like in my garden, it's more like yellowish burnt. Um, so what happens if we train a, a binary tree on this? We might start splitting you know, the feature space in this way, you know, with axis aligned splits, and then the children get split in this way. Um, this is, by the way, done using real computation, but it is a toy example just for illustration. And you know, look at this. You know, what happens here is that at this level, we are left with a, a leaf node, this cell, which has got very little data to start with, and this data says, oh, I'm a cow. And here it says I'm a sheep, and, and here we have grass and, and grass. So what the system ends up doing is estimating this entire region as cow. So if a new previously unseen test point lands in here, or even in here, or even very close to this point, it will say I'm a cow, and here it says I'm, I'm a sheep. Well, if instead we train a dog, this is what will happen. The first two steps are identical to you know, what we've seen previously. But now at this stage, we can analyze this leaf and this leaf. And notice that the histograms are actually very similar. Here we have four grass points and one cow. And here we have five grass counts and one of sheep. And so you can reason about this and you can say, oh, look, you know, the distributions here for these two nodes are very, very similar to one another. So perhaps I would benefit you know, if I merge them together. And if you merge them together, what happens is that you increase the generalization power because now this whole region where you had no training data whatsoever you know, acts as a connection between this region and this region. And it correctly generalizes as grass. 
So this is the intuition behind why DAGs might help you not only you know, in terms of efficiency, but also in terms of generalization, in terms of testing accuracy, which is great news. So this is another representation of precisely what we did. You know, at this point, we looked at the statistics here. This is you know, cow, sheep, grass. We have a lot of grass. It's very similar to this other histogram, so we decided to merge them together. Now, this is just uh, the simplest way in which we can do the training of a DAG, where we can go level, level by level from the root node down, 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 and, and do this analysis and merge histograms together you know, based on their similarity. But there are better ways of doing this, which are slightly more complex. You know, I'm not going to go too much into the details of you know, the training algorithm because I won't have time otherwise to talk about other things. But you know, if you're interested, you know, the slides will be available, or you can send me an email. So I will skip you know, all this you know, optimization uh, stage. I will show you some results. Um, so the sort of you know, applications and results that I will show to you now and in the next talk are a mix between computer vision, machine learning, and uh, medical imaging type of applications because I want to you know, really bring on the fact that these sort of algorithms are designed to be as general as possible, not just to work on the left ventricle of the heart or on kidney stones or whatever. So this is, for instance, on the, um, uh, what's it called, the face data set, the uh, labeled faces in the wild or something like that. Um, we have a, a data set, it's a publicly available data set of you know, many, many faces taken from uh, the internet and you know, these have been labeled with you know, eyebrows, eyes, mouth and so on. And the accuracy of segmentation is what we measure here uh, as a function of the total number of nodes in the classifier. And the classifier could be either you know, a standard set of trees or you know, merged DAGs. And you can see how for the same computational budget, you can get much, much better test accuracy. Of course, you know, the improvements depend a lot on the data set. For instance, in the Kinect you know, data set, we uh, got a marginal improvement in the faces data set much more in the sunful background data set, you know, quite a bit as well. So I'm going to jump over. Oh, it, and the other advantage is that now, because we can restrict, for instance, the, the width of my DAG, which is now a DAG rather than a tree, because I do a lot of merging, you know, it doesn't grow as exponentially anymore. The, you know, the number of nodes doesn't grow with the number of levels, but we have it fixed to, I don't know, 1,000 nodes, for instance, per each level. So we can afford to make this thing grow really, really deep. So here we have 60 levels. And in some applications, this really helps. And it can be trained efficiently, and it can be tested efficiently. So it's really good news. Uh, let's talk a little bit you know, about um, anatomy localization. I know I have 15 minutes now. Yes? <laughs> um, so we have applied these sort of techniques for many, many medical applications. Uh, the first one we tackled a few years back is that of anatomy localization. So imagine that we have patients, and of those patients we have taken, say, CT or MRI scans, big scans, you know, almost full body scans, you know, this sort of thing, or even with the legs, with the head. Um, so what we do is we wanted to build a tool for radiologists or for clinicians to understand this data very, very quickly, very similar to what Doreen was talking about earlier on this morning. And now, if we had a system which was able to very quickly tell me where the different organs are, the, the major structures, then this could be extremely useful because, for instance, imagine that this data is stored in, a, in the cloud. Um, then if I'm a cardiologist, I'm only interested in the heart. Rather than downloading two gigabytes of CT scan you know, for the full body of the patient, I can just download the region around the heart. And the same for the kidney and so on. So here we put together a system which would automatically, in just two seconds, on a completely standard desktop, no, um, uh, no clusters, no nothing, would just parse any CT or MR scan, full body, uh, independent from whether it was acquired with a Siemens machine or a Philips or a Toshiba or whatever it was. And it would you know, uh, provide uh, 20 or so, more than that, if I remember correctly, bounding boxes for 20 different anatomical structures. So left lung, right lung, you know, the hip bones, you know, the femurs, you know, the 
kidneys, as you can see there, the aorta, the heart, and even very small organs like the adrenal glands. I'm not sure how many of you know what the adrenal glands are, but they're very, very small, and they sit on top of your kidneys, and they're actually very important. Um, and so how does it work? Well, you know, by machine learning, we have um, worked with many different hospitals, and we gathered, gathered you know, CT data from all these many different hospitals. So in here, we have American patients, European patients, Asian patients, uh, all different shapes, all different diseases, like massive cysts or missing lungs or very small kidneys and all, all sorts of things. You know. uh, is small kidneys a disease? Um, so what we do is you know, we um, need to design the model. So, okay, fine, we settled for using forests, but how do we use it? What do we do? So to start, this is a, a regression approach because what we want to get out of the system is some continuous variables which tell me the position of this bounding box, say for one organ, in 3D. So we have a 3D bounding box, in this case visualized only in 2D, and imagine that we have a, an anchor point, a, a, a single voxel, then we want that voxel to tell me how far away and in which direction, say, the left wall of this box is, the right wall, the top wall, and, and so on. So six dimensional uh, feature vector. But of course, the problem is that we don't know which landmark to use. We don't know which voxel we can reliably use to estimate with high confidence the position of the, of the kidney. So what we do is you know, we um, throw in all the voxels, or a subset of you know, uh, sampled in a regular grid type you know, voxels. And we have ground truth data for the bounding boxes of many organs, and so we say, okay, out of all these voxels, you know, which ones are visually discriminative, visually uh, distinctive from their surrounding, for instance, and can produce a good estimate, a confident estimate for the position of the bounding boxes. So for instance, voxels which live in midair, in a CT scan they all appear as black, they are indistinguishable from one another, and their position you know, doesn't give you any information whatsoever. So we want the system to automatically discard them. While well, instead a, a point which is you know, attached to you know, an, an appendix, let's say, of a vertebra is very highly distinguishable and very well localized, and we hope that it could be a good anchor point to vote for the position of bounding boxes. But all of this, we want it to be discovered automatically. So we do this by you know, pushing all these points and their descriptors and their voting confidences all inside a regression tree. And what happens is that we optimize a form of information gain, which now is not based on, on Shannon entropy because we are talking about continuous variables, but there is a continuous form of you know, the, the entropy that can be derived for Gaussian um, distributions. And so what we want is we want to get sort of distributions that at the root node that are all very flat and uninformative. But as you split and split and go down the tree, they become more and more peaked and more concentrated around their mean. And so, you know, more um, discriminative. And so, you know, this is a bunch of maths, a bunch of, you know, modeling. We have a lot of, you know, Gaussians, you know, inside these nodes. And because there's this hierarchical architecture, the fact that we have a, um, a Gaussian, which is a very simplistic model, doesn't hurt us so much because they're all combined together. What we end up with, oh, and in terms of features for uh, describing each uh, voxel, just like we did in Kinect, you know, we look around at different you know, regions and look at the intensities, intensities difference in CT or in MR between different boxes. So these sort of things capture gradient information as well as absolute values. And even if you have you know, bias um, non-uniformities due to uh, bias, bias field incorrection in MRI, you know, it still seems to work quite well. Uh, so this is what we get in terms of visualization. So this is a, a volumetric rendering of a CT scan. And these green regions that you see being highlighted have been automatically selected by the system as being good anchor points to predict with high confidence the position of, what was it, the right kidney. So all of this was detected automatically. I didn't go there and say you have to use this landmark or that landmark or that landmark. Also, there is no registration whatsoever. So 
there aren't many papers in, in MIKAI which uh, do recognition without using some form or another of registration. This is one of them. So without using any form of registration, no atlases whatsoever, we managed to extract not only the position of you know, the bounding boxes you know, of the different organs with great accuracy and you know, great speed, but also we go back into the tree and interpret the different uh, training clusters which arrive at the different nodes, and we discover these you know, latent variables which have been discovered automatically, like anchor points. You know, this has been used for you know, figuring out where the kidney is, and this other thing has been used for figuring out where the heart is, and, and so on. So this is very exciting to me. So um, I'm not going to spend as much time for the other applications. I'm going to go uh, through a little bit you know, more quickly, but I think you, know, you get the gist of the sort of methodology that I'm using here. Um, so another piece of work that I did with you know, Ben Glocker, who is now working at Imperial College, and he's still actively working on this you know, field, is detection of vertebrae, spine and vertebrae. The problem is that, um, for instance, in the emergency department of a hospital, um, there has been an accident, you know, a person arrives, you know, the first thing they do is they either take you know, x-rays or they take a CT scan. And because you want to minimize the amount of radiation which you bombard your patient with, you know, normally these scans tend to be very focused. So rather than taking an entire scan of the full body, you take um, a small scan, in this case of the lumbar area only. But then when a radiologist looks uh, at this image, the first thing they do unbelievably, the first thing they do is they try to count up and down the spines because they try to figure out where exactly they are in the human system. So they try to localize, you know, for instance, the end of the rib cage, and they know that that's where the lumbar uh, area begins, and they say, okay, so then this is L1, this is L2, this is L3, and, and so on. And they waste a lot of time doing that. Um, because it's difficult to do it, even for a human being. But here we, we thought of a, an algorithm which can do that automatically and very accurately by using context, contextual information. If you see around you uh, kidneys or you know, a certain portion of the intestine or you know, the, top, the, the bottom part of the liver and so on, you have a certain amount of confidence that you are in the lumbar area, otherwise you are in the thoracic area. And then you can reason in a hierarchical way and you can really come up with a good estimate for where all the vertebrae is. And of course we have some generative model on top of this which allows us also to predict the evolution of the spine outside you know, the, um, the area of the image. Not sure whether that is useful or not, but surely being able to name the vertebrae inside the image is extremely useful from a practical point of view. So here, uh, we want this system, of course, to work also in the presence of pathologies. So the spine can be very highly deformed, or there could be massive you know, cysts or tumors, or you know, if it is an ER department, then many bones may be broken, and, and the, spine, sorry, the spine may be slightly misplaced. Or even worse, there can be nails like uh, devices you know, which has been, have been inserted in previous you know, surgery you know, inside the patient body. And so you want your system to be robust to all these things. So you know, to all the computer visions here, medical image analysis is not easy. So we managed to get some pretty good results. So uh, red is our estimate and you know, yellow is the ground truth. You know, we get very small error in terms of you know, geometric you know, alignment. And the only type of error that we observe uh, sometimes is that you know, rather than detecting a certain vertebra as L1, we call it L2. So there's only one step difference, which is a, an inherent ambiguity that we hope to resolve. But again, the fact that this works with any type of resolution, any type of uh, crazy stuff happening in the images is really good news. Um, oh yeah, here I've got some pretty visualizations. Um, Hervé Delinget talked this morning you know, quite a lot about brain tumor segmentation and in many you know, cases we are working together on this so I'm not going to talk you know, a lot more about this, I'm going to skip it but yeah, we won a challenge, Yoo -hoo. that's great we have some software that you can you know, download for free this, this software is called Geos you know, I wrote it, can you imagine it? and it works, you can download it for free and it will still work and if it doesn't send me an email uh, some more 
pretty slash nasty pictures at the same time of brain tumors you know, being detected automatically. And then some very new work, which hasn't been presented yet, but will be presented at Mikai in Boston uh, in one month, roughly. So we can use um, these sorts of techniques. In particular, here we're using regression forests for super resolution. Great. Uh, someone earlier was um, asking about you know, how can we speed up the acquisition process, which is a big, big, big problem. You know, if you want to acquire DTI images, you know, the diffusion, diffusion tensor images, you know, the patient has to be sat in the machine for, I don't know exactly the time, but well in more than half an hour, I would say. 10 minutes, oh wow, that's good, right, it's 10 minutes. You know, 10 minutes that you can save, you know, the patient. And if you need to do, you know, contrast, no contrast, then, you know, the time increases, right? So Guido is confirming that. So what if instead we can, you know, acquire these images in seconds. If we can do that, then you can capture dynamic evolution of your know, organs or the beating of the heart and do a lot more stuff. So one way of doing that is to use compressed sensing, of course, and that's great news. And what I'm showing here is, can be interpreted as a form of compressed sensing, um, but it is done, you know, using decision forest, regression forest. So here we have a low resolution of a, a diffusion MRI, where the different color, uh, colors encodes directions of diffusivity of your know, water molecules. So, you know, green, I can't remember what the convention is, but, you know, certain direct, it's a little bit like optical flow, really. And this is what we want to obtain, a high resolution diffusion MRI, where you can really see, almost see individual, you know, tracks. And this is work that I've been doing with uh, Danny Alexander at um, UCL, which is, you know, he's one of the top experts in this field. So the problem statement is extremely simple. Given a low resolution context and a low resolution blue pixel, can I infer, you know, through a learned model, the content of a high resolution, you know, twice the resolution grid, the red pixels in this case? Uh, well, it can be done. We have used regression for us in this case. Regression because, you know, the pixels have got continuous values. Um, it could be multi-dimensional, of course, you know, multivariate values, it doesn't matter, uh, like these images are. And of course, we did a lot of comparison with, you know, most standard things like, you know, cubic interpolation, linear interpolation, and other techniques as well. Now, visually, especially in the projector, you cannot, you know, tell any difference, there is any difference between these two, but actually there is, if you look on my screen, and numerically, there, there definitely is. And there are very minute differences which can make the difference between having a disease or not. Um, and the same we have done on some very uh, uh, unusual, non-clinical type of you know, imaging which is called you know, NODI. I'm not going to explain what that is, first of all, because I don't know what that is. So you'll have to ask someone else, but it works. And in terms of errors, quantitatively, we show that you know, using forests you know, works way better than any other, any other um, uh, super resolution techniques you know, applied to these images. So finally, and then I will conclude, uh, this is a, another very interesting and very uh, new project which has to do with multiple sclerosis. Um, so multiple sclerosis is a very nasty disease which affects you know, the white matter of the brain uh, because the myelin, you know, the stuff that you know, carries electrical signals you know, uh, gets corrupted, and so these signals don't travel well through the nervous system anymore. So most people, when they tackle multiple sclerosis, you know, from an imaging level, they immediately dive into looking at MRI images of the brain, and that's a fantastic avenue, you know, we have to keep doing that. But here, we turn the problem on its head, and rather than looking at the patient from the inside, we look at the patient from the outside. What we do is we envision a world where the patients can wake up in their own uh, bedroom and just by simply playing an Xbox, you know, Kinect uh, enabled game, they get tested and their motor skills get measured. So not only they have some fun, not only they keep active, but at the same time we can measure from one day to the next, to the next month, to the next year, how their motor skills deteriorate and whether certain therapies are working or not. So that's the ultimate goal. What we have done so far is we have you know, worked with you know, top, top you know, MS specialists in Europe 
and they have advised us on a set of nine movements. Some of them are standard in the standard neurological tests, some, some others are new, um, which we ask the patients to do. Sometimes they, you know, we just ask them to either stand or sit and just touch their nose like this, you know, very quickly, and we try to see how accurately they do that, or very simply stand, you know, like this and see whether their body sways a lot or not a lot. So these sort of tests, some of them, not all of them, can be automated and we can you know, uh, capture depth videos. We don't use any RGB here mostly for privacy concerns because we do not want to see the faces of the patients. While from low resolution depth images, you know, no one can recognize the patients. Um, so just by looking at depth videos, we you know, push that video through some a very quick and dirty, in this case, registration pipeline and rescaling pipeline so that we have the patient nicely centered in, uh, in, in the field of view. And then we apply you know, decision forest techniques you know, with the usual sort of you know, bounding box localized you know, features to learn at the same time to classify patients versus non-patients and just like before, at the same time also figuring out which part of the videos are responsible for telling me that this video belongs to a patient affected by MS versus, you know, not. And so we, okay, we have, you know, great numbers, you know. In this case, I should say the forest not, do not always win. You know, SVM and especially nonlinear SVM does particularly well in some of the movements. These are the finger-to-nose test, finger-to-finger test is like this. In fact, I cannot do it. Then there is the DRS, what was DRS? Oh, drawing squares. This is a new invented test, which is, you know, we ask them to do this, you know, draw a square in mid air. And there is a lot of coordination, cognitive aspects, and all that sort of stuff. And then the truncal attacks, which is the swaying of, of the body. Now, the interesting thing, when we look at, you know, the selected, you know, discriminative anchor points, we see, for instance, that in the finger-to-nose test, indeed, you know, there is a, the, the map is very hot here, you know, in that space of the you know, space-time video cube where the finger reaches the no nose, and that's very unsurprising, right? But the one thing which is very surprising is in the ataxia. So the neurologists come to me and they teach me that in the truncal ataxia test, you look at the trunk, and you're not allowed to look at anything else in the patient. You just focus on the trunk and see how much it sways left or right. And that's the test. And you give a score, and based on that score, you classify that patient as a severe patient or not, and, and so on. What the system here discovers instead is that a much better discriminator for patients versus healthy individual is looking at tremors here. And this is incredible. I mean, here we have computer vision and medical image analysis, which is feeding back into the medical world and teaching them something that they didn't know. So when we show this stuff to them, they said, oh yeah, this makes a lot of sense because you, know, you can think of this as a way of measuring strength and you know, people with MS tend to be weaker and all sorts of correlations start to pop up in their head. But it also means that the truncal ataxia test, since, since the standard neurological tests do have a strength test, which is separate from everything else, it looks like the truncal ataxia test doesn't add anything to this pile. And so perhaps it's better for them to remove it because it might be a confounding factor rather than something that helps them. And so perhaps you know, you know, our work here, your work here, can help shape up the way in which medicine evolves and medical sciences evolve. So, I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention, and I think take some questions.